So I just was always trying to learn and do whatever I could because I think within a few years I realized this could be a big opportunity and I'm going to do what I can to run with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my dad definitely was um, throwing a lot of stuff at me and had high expectations. It was very high stress. Um, but I do realize now, you know, that made me who I am today. Uh, you know, as much as it was difficult yeah. to go through, um, I kept telling myself there's going to be a, a better uh, or a big reason at the end, you know, for all of this. And I'm just going to keep, you know, plugging away. You're listening to Going Deep with Aaron Watson. You're going, going deep. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate you making the time to speak with us. Absolutely. Um, I want to start off. Logistics is an industry, is an area that literally impacts everyone. The The last interview we just did was with uh, someone developing autonomous driving semi-trucks, approaching the industry from that vantage point. And he made the point that everything in this room was on a truck at some point, at some time. And on, on the flip side, as an operator in this space right now, uh, Initial, initial Logistics is a non-asset-based third-party logistics provider. For people who are not in this space, can you just uh, provide some clarity as to what that means, what that entails, what, what service your business is providing? Yes, absolutely. It simply means that we do not own our own trucks, uh, warehouses, or equipment. So we rely on our relationships with our carriers um, and our partners to provide power for customers over the road shipments that we utilize our contracts with the Class 1 railroads, which they have um, equipment that we use to, okay. to ship product on the railroads, um, which they call that intermodal, which most people don't know what that means, but it's another word for rail. Um, this relationship also is called an IMC, which is an intermodal marketing company. So we say that we're one of the only true IMCs left okay. in the industry. Um, there's not many companies left that have all the rail contracts and are the true IMC from, I would say, like the last 40 years that are still in business. A lot of those companies have been bought or okay. acquired and merged. Gotcha. So... Would, a, would another way to say that on the trucking side, we'll, we'll address the, the rail side in a second, but on the trucking side, would a way to explain that be there's an enterprise that needs something to get from point A to point B, and you talked about carriers as effectively being, my understanding of that is like a, a team of trucks, so so to speak, where there's, you know, down on, the, down on the individual level, there's a truck driver who might be a part of a carrier network. And then you as the third-party logistics provider are playing connective tissue between the enterprise that needs, needs their thing getting from A to B and the carrier that it can deploy X amount of trucks at time B Absolutely. in order to accomplish a goal. Yes, a customer will need to ship their product from point A to B. And then we're the ones that are in the middle that find that carrier. And we're the ones then to dispatch them is what we call to pick up the shipment, whether we bring it across the, the highway to destination or we bring it to a railroad and it gets put on the railroad. Um, then on the railroad side, once it gets to destination, we have another carrier then that comes in to pick it up and then deliver it to the end customer. Gotcha. And would another part of the service you're providing qualify as like being able to make the recommendation as to what the appropriate route is because you're so familiar with it like I just know I need these beans over there but like you would say well this railroad makes the most sense or this because of whatever kind of decision calculus goes into that and proprietary knowledge yeah so um, obviously the railroad goes all over the country but so do trucks um, so with trucks um, going on the highway, there are certain miles that make sense to ship it on a truck from a price pers um, price perspective, um, and same with the railroad. So if you go across the country, say from California to New York, typically that's going to be a railroad move. Um, it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be more cost effective. The only problem is that it takes more time. So if a customer has a time-sensitive shipment, then they more than likely will put it on a truck, and it's going to get there a couple days sooner, but they're probably going to pay a little bit more. Now, this year, this is the first time in my 23 years I've ever seen where the truck price has been below the rail price in that same line haul market. Interesting. Yes. W do you know why that's the case? 
Yeah, I think what we're seeing this year was um, there's a lot of capacity out there. The economy is doing well. People are still buying products, and they're being shipped. The problem is last year was so crazy that there's a ton of inventory. So that's just sitting there, still waiting to be bought up. And there's just a ton of trucks out there with not a lot of business to move. So what's happening is they're having to push down their rates to customers and to um, companies like myself to actually pick up that load. Interesting. So it's kind of like a fight to get that load. You might have like say 10 shipments in this one market to pick up and you have 100 carriers that are looking for a load. So what that does is create a market where they're, it's like a bid war gotcha. per se. So I want to, I have so many questions about like the operations of this business that I just want to completely nerd out on, but to give people context as to what this company is, your role in it and where it has been. Um, this initial is both the name of the company and your last name. It's a family business. Um, and you have an kind of interesting route into this industry. So can you, you started actually telling me before we started recording and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa we got to we yeah. make sure we, get, we capture this. Um, can you just tell a little bit of the background, how you found your way into logistics? Um, what, you know, working that with your, your father and how you came to be the leader of initial. Yes. So I actually was doing some college, um, when I was 18, 19, I was running a pizza shop at the time. And the guy wanted to sell it, and I talked to my dad about buying it. And he then told me that you definitely don't want to buy it. My dad actually owned a pizza shop back in the day, and I really didn't even know that. Um, the guy was making $40,000 a year. So at that time, I thought it was great money. My dad was like, you know, why don't you try and come work for me instead? Um, so I thought about it, and that's when I decided to then work for my father when I was 19. Yeah. I quit college. Um, I was working two jobs, so I worked for him, and I was still working at the pizza shop at the time for probably two years, I would say. Um, so that's how I began into the business, um, and then I was what you call an intermodal dispatcher. My dad only shipped product on the railroad, so that is what we did. We set it up from point A to point B, and as we continued to grow a little bit, um, that's you know my dad decided, hey, why don't we open our own company? Um, I had worked for him for about six years. My brother started working for him. My sister started working for him. And he thought that once he retired, the company that we actually were an agent for, he didn't know what they were going to do with us once he decided to retire. A lot of times what happens is they take that business, you work for them, then you make an X amount of money, and you might not get to do what you want to do with the business. Um, so we opened up Kinesha Logistics in 2003. When he was kind of antsy to start the own thing with with your family was it partially like the hey there's a better way to do this we should do this differently or was it uh would you put it more on like there's a real financial opportunity that we can realize i think that he wanted to he always called it a legacy to leave his children okay um my dad was a salesperson he was a real go-getter and um, he was a founding partner of the company that he was an agent of. So, yeah, I do think that he felt this is the opportunity to give something to my children that could be big and actually be like retirement for yeah. them down the road. So Beautiful. So 2003, made the move. What, what, was, what was your role in all that? So I was continuing to do what I was doing, but also dabbling then in HR, payroll, some finance. Um, we had hired on some salespeople that had worked with my dad in the industry a long time ago um, and just doing pretty much whatever needed to be done. Um, we grew very rapidly, very fast. I don't think we realized that was going to happen. Um, one of the challenges that we had initially was just working with the railroads. They take their money very fast and okay. not having enough money to even operate. So going out and having to get a line of credit with the bank getting those type of things in place. Um, I also was making sales calls with my father, traveling, still doing operations on the road. <laughs> wow. um, so pretty much, I mean, I was working like 80 hours a week, um, you know, claims. I talk about, um, you know, when I started working for him, I pretty much had to do everything. I've touched every piece of this company from pricing to our highway group to the LTL even, um, What's LTL? So LTL is less than truckload. Okay. So it's another mode of shipping as well. So 
I had to kind of do whatever. My dad, soon after we opened, my dad actually had a triple bypass. Wow. And he had to go get that taken care of and was out of commission for a while. So that was really my moment to step up and yeah. really, you know, take control. Was part of the conversation between you and your dad that he was, he was like acknowledging that I'm kind of grooming you to eventually take this thing over? Or was it more of just like a baptism by fire and, you know, I'm just going to throw something else at Christy? Yeah, I mean, I think... <laughs> I think he was grooming me. He was trying to see, I think, which one of his kids were in the best position. And to would really take to it. Yes. Um, and I just have always been a hard worker. You know, you work at another company and you have people that just don't do their job, but I was doing their job too because that's just what I do. So I just was always trying to learn and do whatever I could because I think within a few years I realized this could be a big opportunity and I'm going to do what I can to run with it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my dad definitely – was um, throwing a lot of stuff at me and had high expectations. It was very high stress. Um, but I do realize now, you know, that made me who I am today. Uh, you know, as much as it was difficult yeah. to go through, um, I kept telling myself there's going to be a, a better uh, or a big reason at the end, you know, for all of this. And I'm just going to keep, you know, plugging away. Yeah. I want to put some numbers to that opportunity that you were seeing that could be realized because I was prepping for some of the questions I was, we were, I was sending yes. you some of the questions I was going to ask beforehand and from the research I had done it said that you took the company from 2 million to 50 million in revenue and I was like that's impressive in and of itself but you sent yeah. a you sent a correction email yeah. when I sent that question that that wasn't even accurate yeah so when we had started in business from from actually the agent that we were, we were doing roughly two million, and then our first year, actually, we ended up doing roughly five million, and then it continued to grow um, throughout that. I mean, when I took over, we were probably doing about twenty million, um, but as of last year, we hit seventy-three million, and on pace to do in the eighties this year. Right on. So, to what do you attribute that growth? Because I was I was trying to think about it. Like, I'm an outsider. I can try to read a few headlines here and there, but it's really hard to to appreciate what it actually takes to have that level of execution and consistent growth. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons that contribute to that growth. Um, one of them is retaining a core lo loyal customer base that my father had developed when he was an agent for the, the previous company. Um, and that base really stuck with us and they just, you know, helped us grow by giving us additional business to help us. Um, you know, my brother took those accounts over as well um, once my father retired, and that has been a big part of our customer base, and it just continued to grow into other modes down the road. And modes is what I mean is we just did rail business, um, intermodal initially. Then we branched out to truck brokerage, and then the LTL, which is less than truck brokerage, or less than uh, truckload, sorry. Um, so those customers had additional needs and truly what happens is if you're a one-stop shop to be able to do that then you gain more business we didn't want to say we couldn't do that and they go somewhere else and then they take the business that they're doing with us that we could do so it was branching out being able to to offer more services um one of the things that we also did was um you know talking about branching out to the ltl division we actually bought a blue grace logistics franchise and that actually tripled our LTL business in that arena as well. Um, and what that w enabled us to do was we, Blue Grace is a $350 million company at the time. So we were able to have their direct pricing with their carriers. Okay. So that gave us more power to get pricing um, more competitive with our customers. So being a smaller company at the time, when you're trying to get pricing direct with carriers, you're not going to get the lowest price unless you have volume. So being a franchise for a company like that gave us that volume that we needed to compete competitively. Um, so that was one of the, the um, areas. So another thing is focusing on um, our relationships with our carrier partners. So the carriers that had picked up the shipments for us, specifically on the intermodal, um, we would go out and visit them. We would, you know, appreciate them, talk with them on the phone and let them know that we were always fair with them. Um, a lot of companies in our business kind of treated the carriers like, I don't know what the right word would be, but not the way they should have. Um, kind of like they're the low man on the totem pole. Um, gotcha. But a lot of people don't realize without a truck, you can't buy anything. 
because yeah. that truck is transporting goods to stores that people buy. Yeah. So that's one thing my dad taught me early. We went and visited these carriers. No one really did. We would buy them pizza, um, do certain things like that to appreciate them. So in turn, what that did was when we had shipments to pick up, and they might only have one container to give five different companies. They're going to give that container to me Yeah. because we take care of them. At the margins, they're going to find ways to, to help you out over someone else. Yeah, because what happens in markets when it's busy, like L.A., for example, there's a lot of freight that comes out this fourth quarter. And capacity gets tight. And they're going to pick and choose who they give their, their business to. So when we're say a, a carrier has an issue and makes a mistake and it's like a $300 issue a lot of companies would be like I'm not paying that yeah we would split it and then we would tell them make sure next time you do it this way yeah that way they're not out all that money cuz they still have to pay the driver sometimes it's not really their fault completely um, those type of things. Um, another reason for our growth, I think, also is investment in technology. Um, we continue to invest in the technology to stay ahead. We're competing against billion-dollar companies out there, and we're right there competing with them and taking business off of them as well. Um, sometimes I feel like we might not have millions in systems, but we have things that they don't even have, or we're doing things with systems um, that maybe they're not utilizing, whether it's reporting and that type of stuff. Is there an example of that that you can explain to folks, like how that would be specifically applied to the logistics industry? Um, I mean, I think some of it is tracking shipments. I mean, now, I would say in the last two years, that's become a big thing. Yeah. But back in the day, initially, um, we would have reports that we would personalize and send out to customers and make sure it had correct data, because a lot of times the data that came over from the railroads wasn't correct and making sure just from tribal knowledge in the lanes that they're moving, um, making sure that information information is correct, and just having those type of things in front of customers or things that they wanted that they weren't getting sometimes from billion-dollar companies yeah. that, to me, didn't make sense, but for whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't have it. Um, you know, and another thing, too, that we focused on as well is our employees. Obviously, we invest a lot in our employees um, we do a lot for our people here as far as we have a customer service week actually coming up. We have done this for a long time. And what that entails is we buy a lot of um, different things from, I don't know, like um, we give away Steeler tickets and Penguin tickets. And we buy different things for them to put tickets in that they earn throughout the week by doing transportation and customer service type games. Um, we do Plinko and Cornhole and just we have a chair race in the office, which sounds a little dangerous, but everyone loves it, you know, and we have, a, you know, like a snow cone truck come and we we cater food um, and everybody walks away with stuff. Yeah. Um, everyone gets a prize. Um, you know, I thank everybody for the job that they do throughout the year and stuff, but we really put an emphasis on it then. Um, we bring in massage therapist as well. Um, Are you guys hiring? Can I, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> we do that throughout the year. And then during the customer service weeks, you know, specifically this weekend, we have a Pirates game yeah. Sunday that we're taking everyone and their families to. I think we have 120 people going. Um, so I try to do whatever we can to help people, um, whether it's someone's washer broke down and they need help. Yeah. You know, with that or whatever it may need. And um, it keeps people loyal, too. Because like, yes. so like what, what, what gets missed in those type of stories, I think, is often um, the practicality behind that. It's great to have, you know, a company culture and people who are happy coming into work versus sad, particularly in customer service. But the fact that when you're doing that much for your team, they're going to stick around and stay a part of the initial, te initial team as opposed to going to some competitor because... Yeah they're taken care of and, and they're yeah and I great. always say it, it's an extent like I feel like my people are an extension of my family right we are family business and at the end of the day um you know I have a family I have a son there's a lot of women here who have kids we try to be flexible and understanding they actually today's probably not one of the days but they bring their dogs in they bring their kids in I've had my kid here. Um, we try to do what we can to make it a little bit easier. It's a very stressful environment. Yeah. Um, and to be quite honest, the turnover rate in this industry is very high. And we have retained people, um, I mean, I would say like average 10 years, but there's been a lot of people, you know, one girl has been here 21 years wow. when we started back before For Kinesho. customer service, that's unheard of. And though. most of them out there are 13. There's a good bit that are 13 years, wow. nine years. Um, you know, John's been here 15 years that runs our business. So 
and all our management, same thing. They've all they've all worked their right way up, and we that's the other thing. We try to give them the opportunity to move up, and so they're all homegrown managers here that have been here a long time. Yeah. And I think that makes a big difference in our industry because when you're talking to customers, they're talking to the same person, and not only that, even if there's another person they're talking to, they know what they're talking about because they've been doing it for so long. Yeah. So. So one of the things that I'm hearing, and this is this is a, a framework and a, a gong that I just kind of hit over and over and over again, but there's multiple reasons people buy things. They buy because it's the cheapest and they're looking just for the, yes. the bargain basement deal. They buy because it's the high, the absolute creme de la creme, highest quality thing. And then there's this kind of middle lane where people buy because it's easy. And particularly as a service provider, but I think kind of across the board, people underrate the value of being the provider that makes things easy for the customer or client that you're serving. And what I'm hearing is um, by you, you made the conscious choice to invest in and expand your services so that you could be not just, I'm going to use the basic terms, like the railway provider, but also the truck and the lighter than truck yeah. solutions. And the technology of providing dashboards and data to clients that other providers weren't necessarily offering were at the margins positioning Knickel as Knischel, ah, Knischel, as the provider that made life easy on the client because they got to work with one entity for all of their needs. They got the information that they needed in a clear way. And that plays I, I, that sounds like it play a huge role in the success that you've had yeah absolutely and another thing I want to add to is John that runs our company you know I can't say enough about him um, he has really helped us achieve our growth and our culture here as well he worked his way up and I think people here also appreciate the fact that I have done every job in this company he has done many jobs in this company so we're not just at the top barking orders as if we know what they're going through. I know what they're going through because I did it. Yeah. John has done it. Um, so that, I think, also helps. And then with providing, like you talked about with our customers, like the service, at the end of the day, John will say, a lot of times we get all the same pricing, you know, to an extent. Um, there's not a whole lot more we can offer that's different unless, you know, sometimes it's an asset carrier that can be cheaper. Um, and whatnot, and it depends on what margin you put on there. But at the end of the day, we're trying to prov uh, provide that white glove service to customers because we truly care. And a lot of companies, I know you talk about technology and it takes away some people to an extent. I always want to have extra people to an extent because people want to talk to people still. Even though the technology can do a lot of stuff, there's that people element or the human element that customers still want to have. And that's what we provide as a company that we hope customers continue to use us. Sometimes we have customers that pay more to use us because of that. Sometimes their budget doesn't allow, but then they find out they might not get better service and they have no choice because if they don't have a best service, then they might lose that customer that they're shipping with over a price. Yeah. And as part of the research for this in the previous interview with Chetan, um, the realization that it's not something like even if you just take the truck, forget everything else, just the truck getting A to B and moving the stuff where it needs to go, you can't completely automate that away because there are other things that the truck driver does outside of driving the vehicle in terms of getting that cargo to where it needs to. And I think that, that what, what you're elaborating, despite being the non-asset based third party provider, there is a, 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 an acknowledgement that there is a deep um, need and a specific role for humans to continue to fill into the future, regardless of what technology gets implemented. Yes, absolutely. Um, so anything else? Like, so this is a very kind of interesting place to sit. You 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 built your family business to a very um, you know a very steep trajectory. You're continuing to grow. Are you animated? Are you motivated by legacy the same way your dad was? Are you, wh what are you thinking about as it pertains to, you know, five, 10 year goals and proclamations and plans for this business that you've stewarded for the last decade? So what I'd like to say about that is I do have a goal. I've always had a goal to hit a hundred million. I never thought we would. It looks like we might hit that maybe in the next couple of years. Um, who knows? There's not a lot of companies that make it to that point. Um, so 
I am very um, animated and enthusiastic to keep going and keep growing. Um, I think we have a good thing here. We have a very good name out in the industry. Um, you know, I work with a lot of people that worked with my dad, and they're just absolutely shocked that we've been able to do what we do and compete against these big companies that are out there. So I almost feel like I have a point to prove because at the end of the day, I'm in a male-dominated industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another big thing that we talk about because when I am meeting with the railroads, I'm like usually the only woman in the room of a hundred people still to this day. So I feel like I still have a mission to keep going as long as I can. Um, as long as we can continue to make money and compete. Um, I want to be here as long as I can. I don't know that my son or maybe my brother's son would want to, you know, he has two sons and would want to get into this, but, um, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. I'm open for all options. Um, you know, we'll just see what happens. If As long as we can continue to grow and make money, I'm happy doing what we're doing. Right on. And you said, I think you said the team size is up to 49 people now. Is that yes. Like that? Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty staggering revenue per employee number. Like I, I have a background looking at uh, B2B software companies and one of their key metrics is revenue per employee. And if you're like it, two hundred thousand dollars per an employee that's yeah. pretty darn good in that space but yeah. you're blowing way past that i uh, just to give you some numbers in our space so from a truck brokerage standpoint typically they can handle a million maybe a million and a half per person on our intermodal side depending on the person it's roughly three to five million per person um, but then we also have an agent network too that we started building this past uh, two years. So we have two other operating offices that are agents and we have several other agents that are out there um, doing their own operations, but using our systems and our money basically back office to help them run their businesses. So that's another way that we're continuing to grow. In this yeah. past year, it's about 25% of our business too. Wow. So are there any real significant re- or like regional or geographic constraints to this business? Because we're, we're, you know, with customer service, like calls work from almost anywhere, you know, assuming there's a signal, like, are there other constraints on the business that we might not understand as outsiders? No, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, as long as you have a phone <laughs> and a computer, yeah. um, you can really do the job. I mean, I've had a finance manager that's been here 15 years and she just recently moved to Florida a couple years ago and she wasn't going to move. Her husband got a promotion unless I would let her work remotely. And even though she's a finance manager, we let her work remotely. Yeah. Um, it works out pretty well. Sometimes it would be nice to have that particular person in the office in that role, but we've learned to adapt to it and, and make it work. We get her on the phone, we get her on Skype, whatever it might be for certain meetings. Um, we have quarterly management meetings and she'll fly up for yeah. that um and then our marketing girl lives in washington dc or right outside that area as well and um so i mean yeah i mean you can pretty much do this job anywhere a lot of the the smaller agents that are out there are just a single person or a husband and a wife team um i know another friend of mine she owns a brokerage she has seven people that work from her work for her and they all work from home so it's really a pretty flexible type type job yeah it's interesting that once you jump off into the kind of culture the context of remote work you realize how many things people can just just kind of be autonomous on and as long as they have an internet connection and a little bit of technology they can get done and you can track it i mean i will tell you my my father being from older school um, i know that wasn't something that he thought was like the best idea to work from home even myself somewhat But I think he's starting to realize that, you know, we'll know if someone's not doing their job, depending on what the job is. Um, But I also want to be able to be flexible because sometimes, you know, you might find the right person and they just can't move to work here at headquarters. Um, It's just the way it is. So we're just trying to do what we can to to make it work. Right on. Um, Chrissy, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Yes, thank you. are going to wrap up with our standard last two questions for folks that want to learn more about conditional logistics and all the things that you're working on. What digital coordinates can we provide people that want to learn more? So conditionallogistics.com is our website. We also have a Facebook page, a Twitter, and a LinkedIn. Right on. I'm going to link all of that in the show notes for this episode. It's in the podcast app where you're probably listening to this right now or 
um, going deep with Aaron.com slash podcast for this and every episode of the show. Uh, but Christy, as we do at the end of each interview, I'm going to give you the mic one more time to issue an actionable personal challenge for the audience. So my personal challenge for everybody is to put yourself out there. Be in the room. Um, you never know what connections you're going to make. One of my biggest fears is public speaking. And I had to have a um, public speaking event in front of a thousand people, mostly men. And it was like a TED Talk type of um, situation. But putting myself out there has made me just be who I am today. It's made the company where it is today as well. Um, and becoming like over that fear of public speaking, I think, is just something I challenge myself with all the time. And I just find that every time I do it, I get a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> so, so put yourself out there, get outside of your comfort zone, and just go, go with it. Well, how did the talk with a thousand people go? It went well. When you watch it, you can see I was a little nervous at first. Yeah. Um, but then it's probably the type of thing that when down. you watch it, you notice it way more yeah. than like the average. Well, they person. got me a coach speech or a speech uh, coach, and the interesting thing is, you don't realize how much you fumble with your hands. I had this whole written out speech. And it just turned into just like little dots of things that, you know, a couple words and it just all came together within like four hours. I was like, holy cow. <laughs> so that really helped me as well. So I do a lot of public speaking now. That's awesome. And yes. I, there's something to be said for when you have something that's that severe of a fear, getting over that and the kind of self confidence that comes that you can now apply in any direction is pretty potent yes it is absolutely i'll say that i mean it's one thing i didn't want to do but i tell myself this is what my job is this is what puts food on my table i'm the face of the company so i have to do it and you just got to push yourself that's an amazing attitude i hope that many of the people out there listening will adopt it i'm going to take a little inspiration from it and uh, i really appreciate you coming on the podcast thank you very much we just went deep with christy knishel hope everyone out there has a fantastic day Hey, thank you so much for watching to the end of my interview with Christy. I love covering, exploring, learning about unsexy businesses, businesses that grow in the shadows, outside of the headlines and the hype. I want to know in the comments below other unsexy businesses that you admire that you know are doing really well. Nowadays, I'm too cold for a girlfriend. Nowadays, I don't know what the world spends. Nowadays, I'm too cold for a girlfriend. Nowadays.